saying to pull the trigger to kill your son, you know, masturbates to memory. Did you just give me 40 years? Sir? Yes. You just gave me 40 years. Well, guess what? Sir, what's this? Yeah, that's <laughs> right. This is Jaleel Smith Riley, who is facing charges for murder in Michigan. Smith Riley was involved in an armed robbery on November 16th, 2013 in Norwood, where he and two other men approached a parked car. Inside the parked car was 20-year-old Portia Brooks and her boyfriend, Aaron Martin. Smith Riley knocked on the window with a handgun and forced Martin, who was in the passenger seat, out of the car. Jaleel then proceeded to go through Aaron's pockets and demanded his cash. Once Jaleel had taken every dollar Aaron had, he then took his life with a shot to the head, causing permanent brain damage. However, Jaleel wasn't done there. Right after shooting Aaron, he then leaned into the car and fired at Brooks, who was sitting in the car, twice. And she died three days later. Fortunately, Martin survived the shooting, but sustained serious injury. Before the judge announced the sentence that Jaleel would be facing, Portia's family got the chance to address the jury and the man who took their daughter away from them. Sharon Brooks, Portia's mother, brought the box containing her daughter's ashes to the courtroom, as she had for previous court dates. She stated that Smith Riley had ruined her life and killed her identity as a mother of three. This is what I have left because of his greed, his selfishness, his complete disregard of and disrespect of others and life. But as you can see, I get nothing back except the reality that she is gone. Tia Marie Brooks, Portia's sister, also spoke emotionally and requested that Smith Riley be handed the maximum sentence. I have to deal with life without Portia, so he should deal with life without, without parole. Then, Aaron, who Jaleel shot in the head, spoke to the court. Oh, she's still here with us, and, and she will always be here. Hello. She's our angel looking over us, helping us get through these hard times. As if Smith Riley's crime was not outrageous enough, his reaction to his sentence was even more dramatic. During the trial on August 11, 2021, Smith Riley pleaded guilty to aggravated murder and attempted murder. However, he later decided to withdraw his guilty plea against the advice of his attorneys. From the beginning, this was an emotional day for the families of both of these victims. But when Smith Riley decided to reverse his plea halfway through the sentencing hearing, they were shocked and his attorneys were too, in part because it puts the death penalty back on the table. Prior to receiving his sentence, Jaleel was heard apologizing in court as what appeared to be a last attempt at showing remorse. Additionally, Jaleel's attorney made a final attempt at saving face. And he knows that he can't go back in time and not do what he did. Despite the tears and the apologies, Judge Charles Kubicki, presiding over the case in Hamilton County Common Pleas Court, denied Smith Riley's request and sentenced him to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The 23-year-old monster that is currently rotting behind bars collapsed to the floor of the courtroom upon receiving his sentence. Smith Riley also received an additional sentence of 11 years for a related attempted murder charge. However bad you think Smith Riley's case was, it can't be compared to the infamous case of TJ Lane. This is TJ Lane, who's facing charges for multiple murders in Ohio. TJ Lane was a convicted American murderer who gained notoriety after committing a horrific crime at Chardon High School in Ohio. On February 27, 2012, the Ohio Police Department responded to multiple calls from teachers and students that there was an active shooter in the building. High school, we had shots fired, gun shots, multiple gun shots. Chardon High School, any police up here? Was there someone in the building with a gun? According to police reports, Lane entered the school and headed to the cafeteria. It was here that TJ Lane opened fire and killed three students and severely injured three others. Six people got physically harmed at the hands of TJ Lane that day, but hundreds, if not thousands of people left Chardon High School on February 27, 2012 with intangible pain that will last through eternity.
glances of your friends laying all over the place, there's blood, there's people screaming, everybody's running in different directions and you're just trying to get out. I saw a kid holding a gun pointed towards a group of kids. Do you remember the look on the gunman's face? I never looked at his face, I just looked at the gun. I still can't think about it all because it's just so scary. Lane's actions sent shockwaves through the community. He was swiftly apprehended and charged with three counts of aggravated murder, two counts of attempted aggravated murder, and one count of felonious assault. As if the murders were not bad enough, Lane showed no remorse for his actions at the trial and refused to cooperate with his attorneys. Instead, he appeared in court wearing a t-shirt with the word killer written on it, and even gave the middle finger to the victim's families. During the sentencing hearing, Lane made a shocking statement. The statement caused outrage and disgust, not only among the families of the victims, but also across the entire nation. The judge presiding over the case, Judge David Fury, described Lane's behavior as heinous, unprovoked, and senseless, and sentenced him to three life sentences in prison without parole. Lane didn't even bat an eyelid when he heard his sentence. He remained emotionless and unremorseful. Lane's behavior and reactions were likened to that of a psychopath. However, not every convict remained emotionless after hearing their sentence, like in the case of Ryan Stone. This is Ryan Stone, who is facing charges for going on a crime splurge throughout the nation, including kidnapping and assault, all of which was captured and broadcasted live by helicopters. The chase began after Stone hijacked a car with a four-year-old boy inside and drove off, leading police on a dangerous pursuit that lasted more than an hour. During the chase, Stone drove up to 100 miles per hour and was reckless in every regard of the word. He's seen here overtaking an innocent civilian on the highway, throwing them out of the car before carrying on in the new vehicle. But that's not all. Watch here as he exits the highway, opens the car door at full speed, then slams onto the brakes right before crashing into another car parked in an intersection. Investigators believe this was a sorry attempt at another carjacking. Stone also crashed into several other vehicles during this chase, causing numerous injuries. At one point, he even came inches from taking out a policeman who was trying to place stop sticks on the highway. He eventually crashed the stolen car and attempted to flee on foot. However, he was quickly apprehended by police and placed in a holding cell. As if Stone's actions weren't bad enough, he was caught on tape boasting about his actions to a friend who visited him in the cell. Hey, did you know I made the news in the UK and Australia? What? Yeah, my lawyer told me I made the news in the UK and Australia. If you type in Grand Theft Auto on YouTube, my shit comes up first. Ryan also believed that he should be compensated for his viral car chase because the news channels are using his car chase footage. I'm going to contact Channel 7 News or have you contact Channel 7 News or somebody. You guys aren't getting paid using my name. Stone was charged with 26 crimes involving kidnapping, motor vehicle theft, assault, and eluding police. Stone's sentencing hearing was emotional. In court, many of his victims and their families can be heard speaking about the impact of his crimes on their lives. Some spoke of physical injuries they had sustained in the crash, while others described the emotional trauma they had experienced due to the incident. Stone spoke at the hearing. He cried, expressed remorse for his actions, and apologized to his victims. Isn't it ironic that in the same week, Ryan was captured in the video on the left laughing and boasting about his crimes, and on the other video on the right, he's seen crying and begging for sympathy from the court, as he finally realized the severity of his actions. Despite his apology, the judge in the case was unmoved, noting that Stone had shown a pattern of criminal behavior and that he posed a threat to society. The judge handed down the maximum sentence possible. Stone pleaded guilty to all charges and was sentenced to 160 years in prison without the possibility of parole. Stone was in tears when he learned he'd spend the rest of his life in prison. Stone blamed his actions on drugs and his show of remorse might be sincere. However, some convicts are rather shocked by their sentences, like in the case of Seth Welch and Tatiana Fusari. This is Seth Welch and Tatiana Fusari, who are facing charges for first-degree murder in Michigan. 
Seth and Tatiana were the parents of 10-month-old Marianne Welch, who police said died of malnutrition and dehydration due to neglect on August 2, 2018, in Solon Township, Kent County, Michigan. Child Protective Services had been involved with the family since 2014, after THC was found in the system of their firstborn child. Mary weighed only 8 pounds at the time of her death. Her parents refused to seek medical help, citing religious reasons and distrust of the medical system. The family home was found to be unhygienic during the initial investigation, with evidence of vermin, insects, and mold. The doctor who performed the autopsy confirmed that Mary was suffering from chronic malnutrition caused by withholding food and water. Seth's call to 911 revealed their level of neglect for their daughter. And he said, when you found her, she was already believed to be deceased, right? Yes. And that's when you consulted with a lawyer? Yep. Do you believe she was beyond help already? Oh yeah, he was bad as a daughter now. When in court, the prosecutors made sure to highlight just how neglectful the parents were of their 10-month-old child. You didn't know that. And don't tell me you didn't intend that because you didn't get her a little touch out of that crib. You left her in there. You ignored her because she was an inconvenience. The couple was initially charged with felony homicide murder in August 2018. In June 2020, Seth Welch was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without parole. In 2021, Fusari testified that her husband was abusive and that she was not allowed to take Mary to the doctor. He got very angry with me. He smacked me across the face and he told me that he knows how I... He said, you know what the f I think about doctors. I told you Mary is fine. She's f***ing fine, now drop it. In November 2021, Fusari was sentenced to life without parole for first-degree murder and an additional 15 to 30 years for first-degree child abuse. When the judge pronounced their life sentence, Seth's mouth dropped open in shock and Fusari started crying. For many people, this couple got what they deserved. However, this wasn't the only time a convict got a sentence that felt like justice. There was the case of Esteban Carpio. This is Esteban Carpio, who is facing charges for murder in Rhode Island. Carpio is an American murderer who killed a detective at a Providence police station in 2005. Providence Police Detective Sergeant James L. Allen and another detective were questioning Carpio at the Providence Police Headquarters for accosting an 85-year-old woman, Madeline Gatta. According to police reports, the second detective left to the third floor interview room to retrieve some water. It was here where things took a turn for the worst. Carpio had asked for water, and the two detectives that were in there with him, uh, one left to go get the water and locked the door behind him. And they tragically heard Detective Allen say, I think he's going to kill me. He's got my gun. He's going to kill me. By the time they broke it down, the officer was dying and Carpio had jumped out the window. However, he was recaptured a few minutes later amid struggles with the police. But that was not the end of the drama. Due to the risky jump and struggles with the police, Carpio sustained injuries. When it came time for his sentencing, Carpio came to court wearing a mask designed to keep him from spitting at or biting others. His face was red bruised and swollen. When he appeared in court, his family members screamed and accused the police of brutality. The, back, the family believed that they forced him to wear the mask to try and hide the brutal revenge beating they gave Carpio behind closed doors. In fact, Carpio's aunt went on live TV to say this. It's police brutality. He was mentally ill and he, and he needed help and we couldn't get it. We tried and tried. And he didn't deserve this. However, Providence Police Chief Dean M. Esserman argued that Carpio's injuries were sustained when he jumped from the third floor interview room and resisted arrest. The FBI later investigated the police, but it was concluded that they did not use excessive force. No civil rights violation when uh, injuries are um, incident to arrest, meaning if he's fighting the police officers, the officers have the right to use whatever force necessary to subdue the subject. On June 27, 2006, a jury found Carpio guilty of the murder of Detective Allen and the stabbing of Madeline Gatta. Despite his plea of insanity, Carpio was sentenced to life in prison without parole. At first, he showed little reaction to his sentence and remained unmoved. However, later, in an attempt to win over the jury, he was heard apologizing for his actions. Every day, I face the facts of what I did and what happened. Carpio claimed he was suffering from mental illness at the time of the crime, but the court didn't entertain the claims. 
However evil you think Carpio is, how does he compare to Kayla Mendoza, who tweeted this the same night she took two girls' lives in a deadly drunk driving crash? This is Kayla Mendoza. Ms. Mendoza, to uh, two counts of DUI manslaughter, that's count one and count three. Uh, how do you plead? who is facing charges for double manslaughter, among other charges in Florida. The 20-year-old woman who was not licensed to drive was convicted of the murder of two women while drunk driving in Fort Lauderdale, Florida on November 17, 2013. Before the crash, Mendoza went to a local bar with her manager and colleagues from her job where she drank two fishbowl margaritas. A few hours later, Mendoza got behind the wheel of a Hyundai Sonata and drove the wrong way on the Sawgrass Expressway. Kayla hopped into her car and went speeding the wrong way down the freeway at more than 80 miles an hour. She collided head on with another car, killing these two beautiful young women, Marissa Catronio and Caitlin Ferrante, both just 21. Mendoza was charged with two counts of DUI manslaughter while impaired, two counts of DUI manslaughter with an unlawful blood alcohol level, two counts of vehicular homicide, and two counts of driving without a license causing death. Mendoza's then-boyfriend owned the Hyundai Sonata involved in the crash and explained that the Too Drunk to Care tweet was directed toward him. The Too Drunk to Care tweet was for my boyfriend because he was upset I was out, hanging out with them and with Marcelo drinking because he wanted me to be home. The Ferrante and Catronio families filed lawsuits against Mendoza, her boyfriend, the T-Mobile store where Mendoza was employed, and the Tijuana Taxi Company. On May 4, 2015, two months after pleading guilty to two DUI manslaughter charges, Mendoza was sentenced to 24 years in prison. Mendoza was apologetic throughout the trial. When she heard her sentence, her apology and crying intensified. I don't know how much time passes, I'm going to live with that in my heart every day. After her sentence, Mendoza will also serve six years of probation and is permanently banned from driving a motor vehicle. Mendoza's apologies and remorse showed that she may yet be saved. However, the same cannot be said for Adrian Dunn. This is Adrian Dunn, who is facing charges for murder in San Antonio. Adrian, an ex-convict, was sentenced for the murder of Rakeem Tariq Charles. Police said that Adrian shot Charles in the back during a drug deal in a parking lot on July 16, 2012. To make matters worse, this wasn't even Dunn's first encounter with law enforcement. To prison twice for possessing a firearm after this murder. He committed another shooting a month before this murder, and he's shown zero remorse. Prosecutors urged the jury to impose the maximum sentence, noting that Adrian had an extensive criminal history and had shown no remorse for the murder. Prosecutor Jason Goss can be seen here holding the hand of the victim's parents. Before arguing to the jury that a life sentence was necessary to prevent another family from suffering, as Charles' family had. Her son who has to suffer, and this family who has to suffer because of the defendant. And that's why, that's why we're asking you for a life sentence. If you thought the crimes were horrendous, wait till you see how Adrian reacted to his sentence. Throughout the trial, Adrian showed no remorse and couldn't have been less concerned. He was found guilty of the crime. Still, his attorney argued that a sentence of 35 to 40 years would be more appropriate. His reasoning? Don't give Adrian a chance to go into prison and try to make something of himself so that when he gets out, if he ever gets out, he can try to be an asset to our community. However, the jury deliberated for just two hours before returning with a sentence of life in prison. As the jury's decision was read out, Adrian began to fight with Bexar County Sheriff's deputies attempting to escort him from the courtroom. Dunn's behavior was marked by profanity and outbursts. He was eventually subdued and removed from the court. Adrian's case can be termed a drug case gone bad. However, while he remains stoic and combative, there are other convicts who break down in court and feel genuine remorse for their actions, like in the case of Ellis Nelson Ortiz Nieves. This is Ellis Nelson Ortiz Nieves. The bruises, some of the bruises were in the shape of a belt buckle. Man, I ain't gonna let you make I ain't gonna let you sit here and say no crazy shit about me, man. No, man, because he's a... He's staying shit he don't even know, man. He's facing charges for the murder of an infant in Michigan. The cause of death was physical abuse, which was later ruled as murder. The four-year-old boy, Giovanni Mejias, was the son of Ortiz Nieves' girlfriend, Sonia Hernandez. Sonia claimed she had no involvement in the crime. However, 
her neighbor had a different side of the story. Sonia was well aware. She was well, well aware of what was happening because she told him that was his responsibility to whoop them. Ortiz Nieves denied abusing the boy, but the judge and prosecutors believe his beating the child resulted in his death. Kent County deputies reported that when they arrived at the Gaines Township trailer, where Ortiz Nieves was left to care for several children under 11, it was here that they found Giovanni left on the kitchen floor. An autopsy showed that Giovanni died from internal bleeding caused by an abdominal tear, which would have been caused by an adult, not a child. During the trial, Kent County Circuit Court Judge Mark Trusok can be heard condemning Ortiz Nieves' actions, reprimanding him in very strong words, and insisting that he should never be allowed out of prison. You are the lowest form of human life that I've been able to observe or see. That you committed this murder and that you beat this little boy to death. The judge described the injuries suffered by Giovanni before his death, causing Ortiz Nieves to become upset and struggle with deputies, who had to remove him from the courtroom. You had put cigarettes out on this poor little child. There was evidence of that from the pictures. Anybody says anything back there? Stop this! <laughs> Ortiz Nieves was sentenced to life imprisonment without parole and was given a sentence of 80 to 150 years for first-degree child abuse. Ortiz Nieves' reaction might suggest that he is guilty. However, this wasn't the only time a convict reacted emotionally to their sentence. There is the case of Jordan Fuss. This is Jordan Fuss. I'm oh, sorry. I wish it was me. He did not deserve it. I did. Facing charges for manslaughter in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The 22-year-old was found guilty of DUI manslaughter in a 2014 crash that claimed the life of six-year-old Santiago Geraldo. Fuss, shaking uncontrollably as he entered the courtroom with his family, had a blood alcohol level of 0.21%, which is more than twice the legal limit. He was traveling over 90 miles per hour on Sterling Road when he crashed his 2004 Infiniti G35 into another vehicle at Davie Road just before midnight on October 3, 2014. Prosecutors had sought the maximum sentence for the crime. Fuss attorney argued for a reduced sentence, stating that his client had been so remorseful that he had contemplated suicide. However, prosecutors stated that Fuss had admitted to using alcohol and smoking marijuana since the crash. The Geraldo family cried in court, while the defense argued for a lighter sentence. Santiago's father took the stand and had this to say while staring directly into Jordan's eyes. Hi. May God forgive you, because I can't. You didn't just take my son's life, you took mine too. <laughs> During the trial, Foss can be seen apologizing to the victim's family in tears. I'm oh, sorry. I wish it was me. He did not deserve it. I did. He also expressed his love for his family members and girlfriend, whom he met online after the crash. Then came the verdict as Jordan was sentenced to 14 years in prison. Court imposes the lowest permissible prison sentence allowable by Florida's criminal punishment code, 14.625 years. He continued crying as he learned his fate. I love you guys so much. I love you. Fuss might have learned his lesson. However, some crimes require more than being remorseful, like in the case of Antonio Barbo, a 13-year-old who murdered his own grandmother for money to buy pizza and pot. This is Antonio Barbo, who is facing charges for murder in Wisconsin. 14 years old, Barbo was in court for the murder of his 78-year-old great-grandmother, Barbara Olson. Rather than trying to explain what this 14-year-old monster did, let's hear it directly from the mouth of the killer. I tried to scare her to get money and then use force if needed. Um, an attack, uh... I guess to kill. The boys hid weapons in their pants before catching a ride to be dropped off at Antonio's grandma's house. What happened when the boys got inside is shocking. He knew I was on the run and she said she was gonna call my mom. He nodded and then I took the first swing. Okay, and when you say that you took the first swing is with the hand axe? Yes, sir. Antonio also said that he tried to put his great-grandmother's body in a car trunk, but when he couldn't, he left it in the garage and covered it with a blanket. Judy, Barbara's granddaughter, was the person who discovered the body. She quickly ran to a neighbor's house to call the police. Uh, 
please send an ambulance and the police. My mother is laying in the garage and there's a lot of blood and there's a blanket over her head. There's how a lot of blood. The, how did the towel, how did the blanket get over her head? I have no idea. And how old is your mother? She is um, 78. And is she breathing? I don't know. I can't look. The blanket is over her head and I can't look. Okay, who's here with you? Oh, God, the neighbor. Okay, can the neighbor check if she's breathing? Oh, you don't I'm have to go and look. You don't have to go. If your you neighbor can to. just go and check if she's breathing. Okay. He would like you to check. Are you sending somebody? I'm working on it. I need to know if she's breathing. While Judy and her neighbor are left frantic to call for help and try and save Barbara, Antonio and his accomplice used the $155 to get high and enjoy some pizza. During the trial, you can see Barbo reading a statement, apologizing for the killing and asking for forgiveness. Barbo said he regretted his actions. Regardless of his apologies, Barbo was sentenced to life imprisonment as he continued crying. However shocking you think Barbo's case was, LaShirley Morris's case gives it a run for its money. This is LaShirley Morris, who is facing charges for murder in Atlanta. LaShirley is accused of killing three-year-old Kaywan Mason, the cause of death was physical abuse with a baseball bat, which was later ruled as a homicide. The incident occurred October 21, 2017, when Morris beat the boy as punishment. But what punishment could be so severe that a child is beaten to death? Well, listen here. And then a violent death for taking a cupcake from the kitchen. A child who was inside the home witnessed the attack and reported the events to the police. Not awake, he's not alert. No, he's not alert. He was breathing at first. Now he's not breathing. Morris's sister, Glendria Morris, was also charged in the child's death because she did not intervene during the incident. The victim, Kaywan Mason, lived with Glendria Morris, who was also his legal guardian at the time of the alleged killing. Kaywan and three of his siblings entered the Division of Family and Child Services care after their mother was arrested on a reckless conduct charge in March 2017. According to DFCS records, Mason allegedly left her children home alone, had anger issues, and abused the children. Geraldine Mason, the victim's mother, was released in April 2017 and reunited with one of her children, but requested temporary guardianship for K1 and his twin brother, according to DFCS records. In court, the 911 call LaShirley made showed that the baby was already dead before first responders arrived. LaShirley Morris was found guilty of murder, aggravated assault, and cruelty to children charges and was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after pleading guilty to murder. LaShirley's actions were horrible. However, Hoskins' reaction seemed to top it. This is Jaleel Hoskins, who is facing charges for murder in Michigan for the murder of his girlfriend, Latrice Mays. Mays, a mother of five, disappeared in March of 2013. Her sudden and mysterious absence led to her family wanting answers and ultimately a nationwide search. Initially, Hoskins denied being involved with the murder whatsoever. I have nothing to do with the murder. I have, I have nothing to do with the disappearance. However, Hoskins quickly changed his plea when he heard the testimonials and evidence being argued against him. First, Hoskins' own cousin took the stand. After after the domestic or whatever happened, uh, I guess I guess she after they left, she she said she was gonna tell the police that he stabbed her about doing it. Doing what? Killing. I guess he choked her or something. Did he say he choked her? Yes. Then one of Hoskins' close friends took the stand. He said I did her. I need her. I need some help. She. I can't carry her by myself. Lastly, on the same day of the murder, police dash cam footage showed them responding to a call Latrice had made in which she claimed Hoskins was abusing her. After hearing the piles of evidence against him, Hoskins was forced to change his plea. Hoskins pleaded guilty to the murder of Latrice Mays and also admitted to tampering with the evidence. Hoskins, a habitual criminal offender, decided to take Mays' life because he was afraid she would report his assault on the father of two of her children to the police. Hoskins was initially charged with open murder, which carries a mandatory life sentence without the possibility of parole. Mays was afraid she would not regain custody of two of her children if she did not cooperate with law enforcement in the assault against the children's father. Hoskins was given a maximum life sentence in prison as a repeat offender. He attacked the podium before being restrained by police.
Hoskins' reaction was crazy. However, nothing could prepare you for the reaction of Ricky Hand. This is Ricky Hand. A Springfield man possibly facing new charges tonight after he throws urine and feces on his attorney in court. Did you just give me 40 years? Who is facing charges for multiple robberies in Ohio. Ricky had been on a robbing spree, hitting numerous local convenience stores late at night and running off with some extra cash. However, this crime spree would soon come to an end the night he decided to try his luck with John's drive through In the footage here, we can find the owner of the shop beginning to close down for the night. Little did this small business owner know, there was an armed Ricky hand lurking the building. As Ricky began to make his way to the door, he's greeted by the owner who is armed and begins firing to scare Ricky off. After this failed robbery attempt, the shop owner called the police to inform them that there had just been a robbery attempt that resulted in a man getting shot. Yeah, this is John's drive-thru. West Main Street. A uh, guy just tried to rob me and I shot him. He ran out the back door. Okay, is he injured? I, I think I hit him. It would only take a couple of days for Ricky to admit himself to a hospital in order to treat the bullet wounds he left John's drive through with that night. It was here police arrested and questioned him about that night. I did try to rob John's drive through. He got shot three times. I did the crime, I ain't gonna lie. I, mean, I just wanted to. When the case took to the courtroom, Hand was sentenced to 40 years. The reason the judge gave Ricky such a long sentence is because they were also able to prove he was guilty for carrying out a string of robberies across Springfield, Ohio. Hand lost it when he heard that he would spend decades in jail. Hand reached for bottles of his own excrement and urine, which were hidden in an arm sling, and threw it at his lawyer in court. You can see Hand reach for the bottles of filth. So As a result of the courtroom incident, Han was charged with an additional five counts of harassment with bodily substances, one for his attorney and four for the deputies present. He's also charged with obstructing official business and retaliation. If you thought these reactions were shocking, you'd be amazed at this video of dangerous killers who wanted the death penalty.